Aristotle, the philosopher, uh, got a lot of things wrong, <laughs> including some things in uh, astronomy. Uh, one of the things that he stated was that the stars are fixed, unchanging, and eternal. And Aristotle kind of had some of the pieces of si the scientific method going, but not entirely. Uh, basically, Aristotle used observation and logic to come to certain conclusions. And so, in some ways, you can't fault him for coming to these conclusions. Uh, the observations that he was able to do seem to support this idea that the stars are fixed, meaning the stars don't appear to move relative to one another uh, on the sky. Now, we know that they do. Uh, he didn't have the technology at the time to make those sort of measurements, uh, so you can't fault him on that. Uh, the stars being eternal, not changing, you probably can't fault him too much there either. Uh, the lifetimes of stars are on the orders of millions and billions of years. So watching an individual star over a human lifetime, chances are you're probably not going to see too much in terms of a, of a star evolving. But uh, as I'll talk about, there are certain instances. Now the unchanging part he had the technology available to test that observationally. Uh, it turns out all you really need to do to, to make that observation, the only technology you need are your eyes. There are stars bright enough for you to see just using your eyes that you can actually see change in brightness over time. And I'll give you some examples as we go, so, uh, some classic examples of that. Now. Like I said, the human eye was all you really needed to see certain stars change. Now, for a lot of the variable stars that you can see using your eyes, you have to be observing night after night and make careful observations to notice the changes. But there are certain instances where it's real obvious something has changed. And those instances are supernova explosions. Now, I'll talk more about supernovae later on, but when a supernova explodes, it gets as bright as the entire galaxy, and it also gets bright enough so you can see it in broad daylight. And back in 1054 AD, a lot of people around the world saw that particular supernova that was visible in broad daylight. And this is one record of the 1054 AD supernova. This is in North America. The Chinese recorded this. Uh, the Europeans didn't. This was visible in the day, during the daylight. And so this kind of shows you the influence of Aristotle. Okay? This real bright object appears, and they kind of dismiss it. Maybe dismiss it as not being a star. Okay? Uh, so that can be the power of quote, dogma, and discounting observations, okay? So a supernova like this is definitely observational evidence contrary to the idea that stars are unchanging. Other historically recorded supernovae in, ten, uh, in addition to the 1054 one is the 1572 and the 1604. We haven't had any supernova explosions in our galaxy since that time. Uh, we're probably due for one. Uh, I always tell my students, don't be surprised if you wake up someday and there's a, a bright star in the daytime sky. Because uh, we think supernovae probably explode on the rate of roughly once every 100 years for a galaxy like ours. So the, the 1604 one is the last one that occurred in our galaxy. Uh, other non-supernovae type variable stars uh, that first got recorded uh, was Omicron Ceti, or Mir the Mira variable, in 1596, and Beta Perseus, uh, or Algol, in 1667 were early uh, re 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 recorded, historically recorded observations of that. Currently, and this number continues to grow, there are currently just in our galaxy alone about 50,000 identified variable stars. There are many more than that because we've also identified variable stars in other galaxies as well. 
So this number is continuing to increase rather rapidly with uh, the technology that's now available. Uh, there are more and more robotic telescopes. These telescopes go out and automatically observe the sky every clear night and compile uh, a, an observational record that you can then have a computer go into and find the stars that are variable. So this number is continuing to increase rather rapidly uh, in, in recent years. So let me talk a little bit about some observational astronomy before we get started and talk a little bit about what astronomers can and can't do observationally. And this is an example of what you typically can't do most of the time when you're observing stars. Most of the time, you cannot get a resolved image of the star. There's only relatively handful of stars that you can actually do that for. One example is the sun. So the sun is close enough, we can actually resolve it. In other words, we can actually get a picture where we can see the diameter of the star, and you can also see details on the surface of the star. Uh, that particular image there, you can see sunspots on the surface. But most stars are just too far away for you to resolve them. And there's two issues. One is distance. The other is the nature of light itself. Light itself can limit what you can resolve. And you're seeing a little bit of that here in this image down here. This image down here is showing you a couple of things. But those, these are images of a couple of stars that are real close together on the sky. Now you're noticing there's rings around them. Okay, that's not real rings. Those rings are coming about because of, of the wave nature of light interacting with the telescope. And so you don't get a pinpoint star image. You get a central bright spot and then these rings. The smaller the diameter of your telescope, the larger those rings are. The larger the telescope, the smaller those rings become. Okay? So that figures into what sort of detail, theoretically, you can get when you take an image. Now, the same thing is true when you're dealing with ca cameras as well. Uh, the larger your lens on your camera, theoretically, the finer the detail that you can get in the image. Now, here, we're still not actually resolving the diameters of those stars. Those stars are still too far away. What we're able to resolve here is those two stars are real close together on the sky. So here we've got a telescope that's big enough to do that. If you have a telescope that's not big enough in diameter to do that, you'll get an image like that on the left. You'll see that there's light there from, you don't know how many stars. There may be one star there or there may be multiple stars. Now the other thing that comes into play here as well is if you're using a telescope from the ground, the atmosphere causes the image of the star to wiggle around. Okay, you've all probably seen stars, quote, twinkle, that shimmering. Well, that shimmering is because the light's coming through the atmosphere, scattering the light around. And so when you take a long exposure image of several seconds or several minutes, that gets jittered around and spread out. And that can also cause the image to get spread out like that as well. So the intrinsic nature of light the Earth's atmosphere and the distances to these stars make it, in most cases, impossible for you to get a resolved image. Now, there's been some recent technology, uh, something called optical interferometry, where you effectively make a large telescope, and that has helped us a little bit. Uh, that image on the right there is showing you a binary star system. Uh, this is a series of images stacked together here so you can actually see that star orbit uh, the other star. Now, this bright one here, this one, that's a resolved image of the bright star Betelgeuse and Orion. 
Uh, that's a red supergiant star. Its diameter is roughly the diam uh, of the orbit of Jupiter. So it's really large in diameter, and it's relatively close. So that something like the Hubble Space Telescope, which is above the Earth's atmosphere, can actually get a resolved image of it. In terms of the diameter, the resolution still isn't good enough to see any surface detail here. There's one other thing that comes into play in terms of limiting your resolution, and that is what you're using to record the light, whether it's film or today with uh, digital cameras. You've got pixels on the chip, and that can also limit uh, the detail you can see. So just keep this in mind. This is what we usually can't do. So what can we do? Well, what we can do, most the easiest thing you can do is to measure how bright the star appears to be. Okay? So this image on the left here, these, these two images, this circle is circling a star which has obviously changed in brightness. Okay? And you can tell it's changed in brightness to the other star based on the human eye and how the human eye senses light. And on the magnitude system scale, which is what you're seeing over here, this y-axis is in magnitudes, the dimmest stars that you can see in a dark location using just your eyes are about sixth magnitude on this scale. The smaller the number means the brighter the object. Now, the brightest stars in the evening sky, nighttime sky, are around first or zero magnitude, typically. So this plot here is showing you the brightness of a star over time. And so you can see this star is brightening up, dimming down, brightening up, dimming down. And you can see it dims down to be somewhere around between 8th and ninth magnitude, which is too dim for you to see with your eyes, all the way up to about 2nd magnitude, which makes it one of the brighter stars uh, in the sky. So you can see that star is clearly, quote, variable. So what we're talking about here in terms of variability is usually what's happening with the brightness. Is the brightness going up and down? Uh, another thing about this magnitude scale, again, it's based on the human eye. Uh, the human eye detects brightness on what we call a, basically a logarithmic scale. In other words, if I've got two light bulbs and one is twice as bright as the other, your eyes don't pick it up as being twice as bright. The star that's twice, the light bulb that's twice as bright, you'll detect with your eyes as being less than twice as bright. So again, we detect things kind of on a logarithmic scale or mathematically, if you think about 10 raised to some power, basically your, your eye is detecting the change in the exponent of the 10. Okay? So this difference here in magnitudes in reality in terms of the intensity of light is actually much greater than that. Okay? We're talking you know, orders of magnitude here, literally in terms of power of 10, uh, in terms of the change in brightness. So that's actually a much larger change in brightness than, than what the magnitude scale even indicates. Now, again, to detect a variable star, you need to compare it to other stars which aren't variable. And again, with modern telescopes and technology, I got, go ahead. Well, I'm sorry I didn't ask it. On the previous slide, mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's in Julian. The question is, what, what is the x-axis? The x-axis is time, and that is increments of days, 24-hour uh, days. So were we lacking data points over daylight hours? Uh, that could be. That could be. Mm -hmm. So it could be weather. It uh, could be a variety of things, why there's some, some gaps there. Uh, so that brings up an interesting point. This, these sort of observations can be very time-intensive because you're having to go back and observe that star again and again and again. And depending on how quickly it's varying, you may have to do that once every hour, 
or you may, if it's going slow, you might be able to come back and do it once a night, once a week. It just depends on how quickly it's varying. Now, this is an example of the technology issue that I was talking about earlier. This, this set of data here is actually from a satellite that's observing the sun. But a byproduct of their data gathering is they get the background stars as well, is in the data. And so what they can do is they can go in with the computer and have the computer go in and measure the brightnesses of all the stars in the image. <coughs> and then do that observation after observation after observation. So brightness is one thing that we can measure. Uh, the other thing that astronomers can do is they can take that light from the star and they can spread it out into its colors or its wavelengths. And it turns out that you get, can get a lot of information about the star when you do that. And I'll only touch on a couple of things that's relevant for us today, but there's a whole host of things you can pull out of the spectrum about physical properties of the stars involved. Uh, so on the right here, these, each strip here is a spectrum of a different star. And astronomers don't usually display the spectra like that. They usually display it in a graph where the y-axis is brightness and the x-axis is color or wavelength. And you can see stars have features in their spectra, these dark lines are examples of those spectral features. Uh, basically, it's due to the elements in the atmosphere of the star absor uh, in absorbing certain colors. There's also temperature dependence here as well. And so one of the things that you can get from the spectrum of a star is the temperature of the star. And we'll talk about also you can get motion information out of the spectrum as well. Uh, these features we can reproduce these features in the laboratory. We can measure accurately where the wavelength of those features ought to be. And if those features are shifted to the blue, we know that the, the object is moving towards us. If those features are shifted to the red, we know the object is moving away from us due to the Doppler effect. Uh, temperature is also related to the color of the star. And these stars in here are ordered in temperature. You'll notice this star on the top is brighter in the blue than what it is in the red. That indicates that that star is relatively hot. If you look down below here, this star down here is much brighter in the red portion than the blue, and that indicates it's a cooler uh, star. And, and this is surface temperature that we're dealing with. So temperature, brightness, you can also get composition, magnetic fields. There's a whole host of things that you can get from the spectrum. And in fact, major observatories and the Hubble Space Telescope and uh, telescopes like that actually spend most of their time doing spectroscopic observations as opposed to imaging. So armed with these observational tools of being able to measure brightness, and being able to measure Doppler shifts in temperature. Uh, astronomers now play the game of figuring out what is happening with the star if it's, if it's variable. Again, we can't usually resolve and see what's going on directly, but we can infer what's going on by observing changes in brightness, temperature changes, and emotions. And here's a star that, especially in the fall when this constellation is up, uh, you can go out and observe it dimming once every little under three days. This is Algol in the constellation of Perseus. And normally it's almost a second magnitude star, but then there are these periodic dimmings that happen a little under three days apart. And it happens like clockwork. Okay? So that's what we get from the brightness information. Now, if you get, take a series of spectra of this Algol star, you see something funny happening with the absorption lines, those dark lines. You get, you get 
the line splits into two, one that's red shifted and one that's blue shifted. And if you do it over time, they go back and forth. And that's a signature that we've actually got two stars there, not just one. So we've got a, quote, binary star system. They're both orbiting around their common center of mass. And when one star is moving towards us, it's blue shifted. And at the same time, the other one is moving away. And so it's red shifted. And then it comes back around, and they swap. So that's why the lines go back and forth, back and forth. So again, we don't have telescopes that can resolve this system and actually see the two stars, but we can see what's happening through the spectra. We can see the motion through these Doppler shifts. So we can sort of build a model now of what this, why this thing appears to be variable in brightness to us. We've got two stars in orbit around one another, around their common center of mass. So we can measure how fast they're moving by the Doppler shift. Uh, and given their orientation of the orbit, we can also figure out, OK, why this thing is dimming. Because you can see what's happening. Periodically, one star passes in front of the other. In other words, one star eclipses the other star. And we also have two stars here of different temperatures. The red one, remember, indicates a cooler temperature. Uh, the blue one indicates a hotter temperature. The hotter ones actually put out more light per surface area than the cooler ones. So when the cooler star passes in front of the hotter star, you get this deep dimming. There's actually two dimmings that occur. There's another dimming that occurs when the cooler star is in behind. But since that star is intrinsically not as bright per surface area, there's less of a dimming. So you get that secondary eclipse, which is much smaller, and then you get a deeper eclipse. And that's due to the fact these two stars have different temperatures. So we've actually figured out another way to get temperature here. If these two stars had the same temperature, you'd have equal dimming. But whether uh, it wouldn't matter the orientation of the eclipse. So, so the, the secondary eclipse, and then when the cooler star is blocking the, the hotter star, then you get the deeper eclipse. We've got temperature information. We know how fast these stars are moving. You can use some basic Newtonian mechanics, and you can figure out all sorts of things in terms of what the masses of these stars are. Uh, so you can start characterizing their physical parameters. Uh, mass is really hard to determine for stars when they're all by themselves. But if they're in orbit around something else, then you can apply Newtonian mechanics and Kepler's laws, if you're familiar with those, and you can actually solve for the, the masses of the stars involved. So eclipsing binaries like this are really important to figuring out the physical properties of stars, especially their masses. Yep, go ahead. How do you know that's another star instead of just a giant gas? planet like Jupiter or something like that? Uh, the question is, how can we determine whether we're looking at two stars versus maybe a star and a planet? We can get some of that, a lot of that information from the spectra. So when we analyze the spectra, what we see is superimposed two star spectra. So we know that we're, we're dealing with two stars and, and not a star and a planet. Planets tend to be much dimmer, and planets uh, since they're so much dimmer, their spectra wouldn't show up. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll show you an example where this can be used to, to detect planets as well. And in fact, the eclipses can be used to detect planets. And these eclipses can also give you information about the diameters of the stars. Remember, we can't resolve and see the individual stars here. But how long it takes these eclipses to occur give us information about how wide the stars are as they pass in front of one another. We know from the Doppler shifts how fast these stars are moving. So if you know how long it takes to go from no eclipse to total eclipse, this part here, that can tell you the width of that star. And then you can time how long it takes that star to go from one side to the other. In other words, how long you've got total eclipse. And that gives you information about the width of the other star. 
So you can also get radius or diameter information from these eclipses as well. <clears throat> now, Algol is an interesting system, also from the standpoint of how stars change and evolve over time. Stars don't age like people. Uh, stars, how fast they age depends on their mass. The more massive a star, the shorter its lifetime. The lower the mass, the longer the lifetime. So going through and figuring out the parameters of ALGO, we figure out that we've got a high mass star next door to this low mass star. And we know that low mass star is, quote, older or more aged because one of the things that stars do when they age is they go through a period where they'll expand. And the lower mass star is expanding and is actually losing some of its hydrogen gas to the larger mass star. Now this is what was originally called algal paradox. How can you have a more aged low mass star next to this high mass star that should have a short lifetime? And the answer to that is you're not seeing the original configuration of this binary system. This binary system probably started out like that, the top one. This start out with a higher mass star next door to a lower mass star. The higher mass star ages more quickly and then goes through this phase of expansion. And then it expands, but since it's next door to this other star, gravity pulls some of the mass, some of the material from the other star onto it. And so you have mass going from one star to the other. So you literally ha are having the masses of these stars change. And so the, st the star that was probably originally maybe three solar masses is now less than the mass of the sun. And the other one that may have been around the mass of the sun is now almost four times the mass of the sun. So that gives this illusion that you've got stars of different ages. They form at the same time, but the, there's been a change in mass. So variable stars, especially binary stars like this, give us interesting laboratories to test uh, how stars age over time, especially in binary systems like this. There'll be some other interesting aspects of this later on that I'll show you. Uh, a variable star that you can see this time of the year uh, using your eyes is Beta Lyrae, uh, next door to Vega. Uh, you can watch it go through its periodic dimmings. Uh, again, that's characteristic of a binary star system, similar to Algol. Uh, this system is actually probably losing a lot more mass to its companion, so much mass that there's actually a disk of material around the other star. So this on the right here is an illustration. This system is close enough, and with the Chandra X-ray Observatory and X-rays, you can get a resolved image of this system. So you can see the star, and then you can see the, the, the disk of material falling around the other star. And this is kind of an animation of kind of what's probably occurring there. So this is another example of an eclipsing binary system. Uh, this is another eclipsing binary system. Some of these stars end up really close together. This is an eclipsing binary system where the two stars are actually in contact. Uh, systems like this will have orbital periods uh, of maybe six hours. So these guys, these guys are going around each other real rapidly uh, to fully model what's happening to the brightness. In other words, to reproduce this light curve, how the brightness is going up and down. You can't totally explain it just by the eclipses. 
which indicates that there are probably dark spots or star spots on the surfaces of these stars. So just like the sun has sunspots, stars can have star spots, and they can often have spots much bigger than the spots that you have on the sun. This is an example of such a system that I've actually done research on. Uh, these stars aren't quite in contact. They're almost in contact. It only takes these stars about six hours to whip around one, and e one another in orbit. And with this system, too, to fully explain what's happening to the brightness, uh, you have to introduce spots, these cooler, uh, dimmer areas on the surfaces of the stars. So again, observationally, we can monitor what's happening to the brightness. Down here, this is what's happening Doppler shift-wise. So that we can monitor the apparent speed uh, at, with the Doppler shift. Uh, so here's an example of planets. Now, the technology to actually detect an eclipse due to a planet going across the front of a star has only been around for the last 10, 15 years. Uh, because the dimming you've got to measure, it's not much. You can notice on this scale here, this is, we're dimming by a tiny amount here on that scale. So it's usually, with most telescopes and most setups, you're not going to be able to detect this. You need to be able to do what we call high precision photometry. You got to be able to measure that brightness out to several uh, decimal places. And that's one of the ways we can tell it's a planet. It's got to be something small if it's only causing a real, real tiny dimming like that. So since about 1995, people have been detecting planets around other stars. One way that they've been doing that is with the Doppler shifting. Only You only see the star Doppler shift. And that, too, is a very small measurement because these planets are only causing the star to move a little bit, very slowly. And in certain is if the orbit of the planet is just right, the planet goes in front of the star and you get these tiny dimmings uh, that can verify that, you, that you're dealing with a planet there. So, so far I've been talking about changes in brightness due to stars being in binary systems. That's not, that's not the only mechanism. Uh, there are stars that are all by themselves and they're changing in brightness. And one example of these are the so-called Cepheid variable stars. Uh, there are some examples that you can go out using just your eyes and, and notice the changes in brightness. Uh, Delta Cephei, the one that all of the Cepheids are named after, uh, is visible to the naked eye. Uh, Polaris is also an example of a Cepheid star. Polaris actually changes in brightness. Uh, Eta Aquila, which is up this time of the year. You do get some Doppler shifting due to the surface of the star coming at you and going away and coming at you and going away. So Cepheids are an example of what we call a pulsating variable star. These stars can't find stability quite. They try. They'll shrink. There'll be some internal changes in the star, which will then cause them to expand, which causes some internal changes, which causes them to shrink. So it's kind of like the thermostat on your air conditioner, going on and off, on and off. And that's what these stars are kind of doing. Now, as they shrink, the surface area becomes less. Therefore, the brightness comes down. As they expand, the surface area of the star goes up. The brightness goes up. And you can also monitor changes in the temperature of the star as well. So these stars are literally kind of beating like a heart. Okay? And it turns out not all Cepheids beat at the same rate. Some pulsate faster than others, and it turns out it has something to do with their size. The really big Cepheids, the massive, large diameter ones, take a long time to go through a pulsation. The smaller ones will go, do so more quickly. And so the, the period of variation can last from three, 
for the small ones up to maybe 100 days for the large ones. And that can also be correlated to their intrinsic brightness. Now, stars are like light bulbs. They have an intrinsic wattage. Okay? And the large Cepheids have a very high wattage. Uh, and on the graph here, you can see the wattage for some of the brightest Cepheids are on the order of 30,000 times the wattage of the sun. And then the dimmer ones are also pretty bright. They're about 1,000 times the intrinsic wattage of the sun. Now that becomes important because these are actually nice tools in astronomy. Cepheids are something we call a standard candle. Because one of the nightmares in astronomy is trying to figure out how far away something is. And one way you can figure out how far away something is, is if you know the wattage of it and you know how bright it appears. So if you've got a 60 watt light bulb and you notice how bright it appears to you, you can estimate how far away that 60 watt, 60 watt light bulb is. You play the same game with stars. If you have a star that you somehow know what its wattage is and you then observe how bright it is, those two things go into figuring out what the distance is. So if you can know any two of the things there, you can figure out the third. And with Cepheids, their pulsation period tells us their wattage, so we can figure out what the luminosity is. We can then simply measure very easily with a telescope how bright they are, and then we can calculate what the distance is. And since these guys are really bright, you can see these a long ways away. In other words, millions of light years away. And in fact, the Hubble, Edwin Hubble, the guy that the Hubble Space Telescope is named after, used Cepheid variable stars in the Andromeda galaxy to figure out its distance. So he was able to take a series of images, and since these stand out because they're really bright, and they're beating like a heart, they stand out in these images of these galaxies. So he was able to, using the 100 inch telescope at the time in the 1920s, this was the first variable Cepheid that he was able to pick out of there. And from that, he was able to get a distance of about two to three, uh, two to three million light years away, which placed this outside of our galaxy. And so, one of the primary missions of the Hubble Space Telescope and why the Hubble Space Telescope is called the Hubble Space Telescope is one of the primary missions was to use it to observe Cepheid variable stars and other galaxies to get accurate distances to those galaxies. And that's what you're seeing here. This is a different galaxy. This is a series of Hubble Space Telescope images of that Cepheid variable. So if you can measure how long it takes to go through a pulsation, measure how bright that star appears, you can back out what the distance to the galaxy is. And you can test yourself, because there's several Cepheids. They, they pointed out that there were several Cepheids in that galaxy. So you can redo that calculation for the same galaxy and get an accurate measurement. And again, this is the first Cepheid that uh, Hubble used in the Andromeda galaxy. This is a set of recent Hubble Space Telescope images of that star. With the improved cameras, you can really resolve that. You can't resolve it as a diameter, uh, but you can resolve it among the other stars. So this led to the discovery that space itself is expanding. The so-called Hubble expansion of the universe came out of this. Because uh, he was now, he had a tool to measure distances to galaxies. Uh, using spectroscopy and, and the redshifts, he could figure out how fast the galaxies appeared to be moving away from us. He was able to figure out that there's a relationship between how fast the galaxy appears to be moving away from us and how far away it is. And it's a linear relationship pretty much uh, for at least relatively nearby galaxies. And so the further away a galaxy is, the more its spectrum is redshifted, indicating the further away it is. And this, too, then, once calibrated, is a way that you can figure out distances to galaxies. But it requires using Cepheids to, to do the initial calibration. 
So again, in a two-dimensional sort of analogy, the universe is literally doing this. The space itself is stretching. As space stretches, it carries things further apart. So it literally is carrying galaxies further apart from one another. So if each one of these stars on this surface represents a galaxy, as the universe expands, those galaxies get drugged further apart over time. And so Hubble used Cepheids to establish that. We'll come back to that a little bit in a bit. There are some other variability in stars, other mechanisms. Uh, this is a class of, of variable stars that I do quite a bit of work on. These are the so-called B emission stars. These are large, hot, rapidly rotating stars. And in fact, in this cartoon image here, these things are rotating so fast they're not a sphere. They're more oblate like that. And periodically, these things will, quote, erupt. They will actually lose gas off the surface into more or less a disk or a ring around the star. And that changes some things in terms of its brightness, uh, changes some things in terms of what the spectrum looks like, and, that, and that's what I study. Uh, one of these that you can easily go out and see is Delta Sco. It's up now in the nights, that part of the Scorpion. Back in 2000, this star went through a brightening, uh, probably because this thing is also a binary. Another star got real close, probably pulled some gas off the surface. And in fact, this year, it's gone through some more brightening because this other star goes around about once every 11 years. Uh, yep. The emission is from the equator there? So the emission, yeah, is from the gas that gets slung out above the surface of the star. And so instead of having an absorption feature, you'll have an emission feature. Is what, and that's what you get when you're looking at just a hot gas all by itself, as opposed to looking at light coming through a gas. There are other classes of, quote, eruptive variables. Uh, the sun, when it's active, will put out solar flares. Uh, there are other stars that also put out flares. In fact, flares much bigger than what the sun does. Uh, you know, that looks pretty impressive, but some of these flare stars put out even larger flares than that. And again, that shows up as a brightening. So as the flare gets ejected, uh, you get a, a spike in the brightness. Uh, we talked earlier about Cepheid stars not quite being stable. Really massive stars, the, the large end of the masses of stars, those stars are not stable. They don't always pulsate quite like a Cepheid, but they're so unstable, they actually lose some of their material, uh, and that can cause changes in brightnesses. Here are some resolved images of a shell of gas that's been ejected from this very massive star. Uh, you can see the same thing over here. And these are something called luminous blue variables because they're very large, very hot uh, stars. Back in 2002, it brightened up. And that light, traveling at the speed of light, went out. And the light that's going perpendicular to us hit gas that this star had ejected at earlier times, changed the direction of that light so that there was a light echo, a delay. And you can see as the light travels and hits more and more of this material perpendicular to our line of sight, it illuminates more and more of that material that was ejected a long time ago. So that material isn't from the 2002 eruption. That actually happened uh, a long time ago. So this star apparently goes through some sort of eruptions from time to time. There's kind of a reverse eruption kind of with some stars. Some stars have the right sort of temperature and com uh, composition that they sometimes actually form soot in their atmosphere. And you know how literally carbon soot is dark and that can cause some periodic dimmings of these stars. And these R core Bohr stars are an example of that. So normally they're up here at this brightness, but when they go through a period of carbon soot formation, it causes a dimming uh, of the brightness of the star. Uh, but let's get back to some fun with binaries, especially close binaries. Uh, 
especially binaries where you've got a quote ordinary star orbiting real close to a white dwarf star. Now a white dwarf is what the sun will eventually turn into. Now, I mentioned earlier when stars evolve they expand, but there's actually two things that occur. Their outer layers expand, but their core contracts. And for stars about the size of the sun, that core is going to contract and become about the same diameter the, as the Earth, but they're going to be very, very dense and hot. And so that's what a white dwarf is, essentially. And when you've got an ordinary star really close to one of these white dwarfs, close enough so that the companion loses material, you can form one of these can accretion disks around the white dwarf. So that material is spiraling in. As that material spirals in, it gets hot. And in fact, a lot of times in these systems, the brightest part of the binary system isn't the stars, it's this accretion disk. Because you have all this release of gravitational energy as this stuff spirals down onto the white dwarf. And there's a whole host of variability that can occur in these white dwarf binary systems where you've got a white dwarf accreting material from the companion star. And this accretion of material often isn't in a nice uniform stream of gas. Sometimes there's a big bubble that gets burped from one star to the other. And when that happens, you get a big release of gravitational energy and heating, and so you get these periodic, semi-periodic brightenings of that accretion disk as a big blob of gas falls into the accretion disk. And this forms a class of eruptive variables called dwarf novae. Another type of eruption that can occur in these white dwarf binary systems is something called a classical nova. Here you literally get a, an explosion. You get a thermonuclear explosion that happens on the surface of the white dwarf. So you've got this hydrogen gas building up on the surface of the white dwarf. And the temperature is creeping up on the surface of the white dwarf and creeping up and creeping up. And eventually you reach a point where the temperature and the density of that hydrogen gas is high enough for fusion to occur, just like in a hydrogen bomb. Now, just like a bomb, you need some sort of bottle to bottle that energy up so that it gets released all at once. And the gravitational bottle is the white dwarf. The white dwarf doesn't change or cool or anything as you pile material on it. And so it acts like a gravitational bottle. Eventually, you reach the flash point for fusion. And then you get this surface explosion on the surface of the white dwarf. And that expels or ejects that layer of hydrogen gas that was on the surface of the white dwarf. And you get a large brightening of the object. These things will get to be about 10,000 times the brightness of the sun intrinsically. And this particular one uh, was resolvable in terms of the expanding bubble of gas uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is also another example of a light echo. This is interstellar dust and gas uh, that that light traveled perpendicular to our line of sight, hit, and then head, headed to us. So that showed up later on. But what's the time difference between before and after? Uh, this before and after, uh, that was on the order of one or 100 to 200 days. I don't remember exactly. Now, there's some other explosions that you can cause in these binary white dwarf systems. And that's these type 1 supernovae. So again, you have an ordinary star, a white dwarf. The white dwarf is receiving gas from the neighboring star. But it turns out white dwarfs have an upper mass limit. A white dwarf can't be any bigger than about 1.4 times the mass of the sun. If they get bigger than that, they collapse further. 
And so if you've got a white dwarf and it's real close to 1.4 solar masses and the companion star is throwing mass onto it, it's going to get too heavy. And it's going to collapse. And when it collapses, it heats up. White dwarfs are primarily carbon. And you'll get carbon fusion. In this case, the entire white dwarf will explode. And that's what a type 1 supernova is. And these get much brighter than classical novae. These will get as bright as an entire galaxy. In other words, about 10 uh, billion times the brightness of the sun. There's another mechanism for exploding supernovae. And that's when you've got a massive star near the end of its life. Its core will fuse all the way to iron. Iron cannot fuse to itself or anything else and produce energy. So the core implodes. That creates a temporary vacuum in the center of the star. That causes the center portion of the star to come down onto uh, the collapsed core. That material heats. It smacks off the core, causes a shock wave that goes out and, and causes the explosion of the star in that instance. So there are two mechanisms for uh, the supernovae, the type 1 with the binary systems and then the type 1 with the massive stars near the end of their lifetime. Observationally, if you monitor what their brightness does over time, you can tell the difference. Uh, both of these can. Uh, bo both of these, the, and the question is in terms of element formation, uh, in fact, we'll skip right to that. Uh, in the periodic table down here, the elements labeled in blue that you find in the universe today were all produced in supernova explosions. And some of these can be produced in type 1 and type 2. Uh, the Starting composition's a little bit different because with the type 1, you're starting with carbon and exploding it. Uh, with the type 1, you're starting more with more hydrogen to begin with uh, in the explosion. But they both produce enrichments in terms of heavy elements in the universe. So a lot of the precious metals, uh, things like that, that are, are all produced in, in supernova explosions. Supernovae can also be used as standard candles. Uh, supernovae, the type 1 supernovae, are a very consistent thing. You're basically rolling that white dwarf over its mass limit. So you get a very consistent explosion, a very consistent maximum brightness. So then you can use that as a standard candle to measure distances to galaxies. Most supernovae that we observe happen in other galaxies. And this is a particular galaxy that we've observed a couple of different supernovae in. Back in 2005, there was one. And here in 2011, there's another. If those are type 1 supernovae, you can use that as a standard candle and then measure the distance of that galaxy. That could verify also the numbers you may be getting with Cepheids observing that same galaxy. So again, these get to on the order of 10 to 100 billion times the brightness of the sun intrinsically. Here's another supernova exp exploding in another galaxy. And since they get so bright, you can see these guys not only at millions of light years away, you can see them little, literally billions of light years away. And so if you want to measure distances to the most distant galaxies, you want to observe supernovae going off in those distant galaxies. And that's what you're seeing here. This is a supernova going off in a galaxy that's probably a few billion light years away. If it's a type 1, you can then use its brightness to get the distance to that galaxy. You can also tell it's redshifted. See how red it is? It's redshifted, which means it's at an enormous distance from us in terms of the redshifting as well. And so what they've done with the Hubble Space Telescope and ground-based telescopes, they try to identify the ones that are type 1, go out and measure the brightness when it's at its maximum. You can then use that to get distances to those galaxies. Now, again, remember the redshift is actually due to the expansion of space itself. 
So as space expands, the wavelength of the light actually gets stretched as well. And so what you're getting when you measure the redshift of the galaxy is you're getting a record of how much space has stretched since that photon of light got emitted. And so for the most distant galaxies, you have to take that stretching of space into account when you're figuring out the distance. So in addition to knowing what the intrinsic luminosity of the supernova is, knowing what the observed brightness is, you also have to take into account the redshift so you know what the stretching is. Because that figures in here as well. But if you take all of that into account, you can measure distances to those very distant galaxies. And you can get a record of what the stretching of space has been over time. Because when you look at a distant galaxy, you're seeing it how it was sometime in the past. So you're literally looking back in time. When something is a million light years away, you're seeing light from a million years ago. A billion light years away, you're seeing the light in the galaxy a billion uh, uh, years ago. So through these observations of the supernovae, what we're able to get is an expansion history of the universe. Has the Hubble expansion been constant the entire time? And the answer appears to be no. And in fact, the surprising result that they found, starting back in about also right around 1995, was that the universe is expanding faster today than what it did in the past which wasn't what they were expecting. They were expecting that the gravity of the universe would slow down the expansion of the universe. But that doesn't appear to be happening. The opposite appears to be happening. The expansion seems to be speeding up. It appears that about 5 billion years ago, the expansion rate started to increase. So it looks like initially the universe started to slow down, and then about 5 billion years ago, the expansion rate increased. Now, this actually verifies something that Einstein predicted, but threw out. Uh, Einstein predicted something called the cosmological constant, basically something that acts kind of like anti-gravity to cause space to, to uh, expand. And he'd be real happy with these results today to find that the universe is actually speeding up due to an anti-gravity sort of cosmological constant. The other name for this that you may have heard of is something called dark energy. It's some entity in the universe which is causing space itself to accelerate in terms of its stretching. And if you take into account the entire mass energy budget of the universe, this stuff accounts for about three quarters of the mass energy budget for the entire universe. And astronomers are in this awkward position right now that we can see what this stuff is doing, but we don't know what it is. We don't know how it behaves other than causing the universe to expand at a greater and greater rate. We don't know whether this is going to continue. We don't know the origins of this exactly, so this is one of the great mysteries uh, in the universe right now. The other great mystery that I didn't touch on because it really doesn't fall into this topic is, is the dark matter that's in the universe as well. So to sum things up here, uh, there's a whole zoo of different types of variable stars. Uh, some of them are due to binaries. Some of them are due to intrinsically things that are happening to the star, maybe pulsating, uh, maybe going through eruptions, maybe going through a type of supernova explosion. So again, to sum things up, the various mechanisms are things like pulsations, star spots, flares, eclipses, accretion disk variabilities, thermal nuclear explosions, and then things like uh, type 2 supernova, which are core implosions that trigger an explosion of the entire star. And so variable stars help astronomers to measure distances, 
to measure stellar properties, to test our understanding of stellar physics and stellar evolution, have allowed us to discover the presence of this dark energy in the universe. And to end, if you want to get involved, uh, there is an amateur group called the American Association of Variable Star Observers. Uh, at, and you can reach them at that particular web address. They will take observations, however you want to do it. Uh, if you just want to go out with the naked eye and observe some of these naked eye variables, they'll take your naked eye observations. If you want to do it with binoculars to do dimmer ones, they'll, they'll let you do that. If you have a telescope and a CCD camera and want to observe uh, variable stars and send in your observations, they'll, they'll do that as well. So they're kind of a clearinghouse for uh, amateur astronomers uh, to submit their observations. And this field of variable star research is one of the few fields in astronomy where amateurs can really contribute in a major way. So I'll stop there and take any questions. There's a question in the back there. Hi. I don't know that it's on. Are you sure? Okay. Um, my background is in both science and in communication, so I get this question all the time. And all of us, we all know why this is important, but as an astronomer, I'd be interested in knowing what your standard response is when people ask you why all this matters. Well, why all this matters, uh, there's an interesting book by Neil deGrasse Tyson called Death by Black Hole. <laughs> and uh, what you don't know might actually kill you. Now, you hear things about ast asteroids and comets hitting the Earth. Uh, supernova explosions are another danger that we have to look at. So th and things in astronomy that might kill you do include things like asteroids and comets if they hit the Earth. Uh, supernovae, that any supernova that go off within about 100 light years or less of us, we would be bathed in a lot of hard radiation. Uh, some of the extinction events that have happened in geological time may have been due to supernova explosions. So the more you know about the universe, the better, just from a practical standpoint, uh, is, is one response that you can give. Um, the question I've got is, um, I, I saw like a doomsday type thing of top ten things you need to worry about in the universe on you know Discovery Channel or something like that, and something that scared me the most out of the top ten that I haven't heard at all today was uh, gamma ray bursts. Is that something that we, I mean, like you said, what you don't know may be able to, and that to me scared me to death. I'm just curious, what's the possibility that a gamma ray burst and its effects could ha uh, have against us? Uh, gamma ray bursts, there are some people out there who also are trying to correlate those as a possibility for certain extinction events on the Earth as well. Uh, our, loc our present location in the galaxy, our galaxy is kind of like a pancake, and uh, the pancake has a thir certain thickness to it, and we're kind of in the middle of the thickness, but we're not always in the middle of the thickness. Sometimes we're a little above the pancake, sometimes we're a little below, and when we're above or below, we're more exposed to these gamma ray burst events. Now, what he's talking about, and people are still trying to figure out the mechanism uh, these are probably explosions that are probably even more energetic than the supernovae that I talked about. And these are probably due to s some special stars called neutron stars that I didn't talk about being in orbit around one another and eventually coalescing. And when they coalesce, they probably cause these, these gamma ray bursts. And so, yeah, th those are another supernova explosions. The, the tricky ones are the type 2 uh, excuse me, the type 1 supernovae, because the progenitors for those are harder to find because they're not as bright. The type 2 supernovae are due to these big, bright stars at the end of their lives. We know where a lot of those are, Betelgeuse and things like that, and we know that they're far enough away. But the progenitors for type 1 supernovae are this ordinary star and this white dwarf, and that's not all that bright. And so there may be some progenitor type 1 systems out there within the uncomfortable limit. And so finding those are, are an important thing. In the past, it seemed like there was a d debate going on about whether or not the, the universe was expanding continually or eventually would be collapsing, whether it was open or closed. 
Is the consensus now, consensus now that the, the universe is going to continue expanding forever? The consensus now is with the discovery of the dark matter in that, that graph that I showed you here. If dark energy continues to do what it's doing, then the universe probably won't collapse. It'll, it'll continue to, to expand. And since we don't know what the dark energy is, we don't know whether it's going to turn off. Because it appears maybe it turned on five, bil five billion years ago. We don't know whether it's going to turn off in the future. But if it continues to do what it's doing now, uh, you're not going to have a collapse. Uh, yes, sir. I was wondering if, um, as a professional astronomer, and noticing some of the big changes that you had talked about in the mid to late 90s and into the 2000s, and uh, some of those changes happening very quickly, and atmosphere being an effect on that, on observing that. Uh, what about like greenhouse gases and things like that? I mean, what, what kind of effects can you see that having? Uh, astronomers try to circumvent that as much as possible by using space-based uh, telescopes. Things like the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, there are other space telescopes that you may or may not have heard of. There's the Chandra X-ray Observatory, the Spitzer Infrared Observatory. Uh, so astronomers try to circumvent that. There's still ground-based uh, observations that have to be done. And astronomers do characterize what's happening to the atmosphere in terms of it, how it absorbs and things like that. So they do have to take that into account. Will we learn more information about dark energy from observations in the sky or maybe on Earth, like through the Large Hydrogen Collider or things like that? Uh, the hope, I think, with the Large Hadron Collider, I think that I think they're hoping more to discover something to answer the questions about the dark matter. Uh, the odds that they're probably going to discover something to answer the question of dark energy probably isn't as high. Uh, but they hope. Because uh, the thing with the Large Hadron Collider, the interesting things will be things that they find that they didn't predict. And if they find things that they didn't predict, then that may help us figure out what dark matter is, dark energy, uh, things like that. I've sort of got two questions. How, how old is the universe? Have they, have they decided? What's the estimate right Yeah, now? it's 13.7. It's OK. And, and how far is the farthest object that we can see? Ah, interesting question. The stretching complicates the issue. Okay, so when we look at this galaxy here, okay, uh, we're seeing it how it appeared when the light left, and there's been stretching of the universe since then. Okay, so the so that galaxy may be on the order of forty billion light years away from us as we speak right now. If you stretched a ruler between it and us. Right, so then <laughs> how, how do you come up with 13.7 well, billion? Well, the, the, the thing to keep in mind is you're talking about the age of the universe, OK? And this is a stretching not a galaxy moving through space. Now, what he's kind of getting at is a speed of light issue here. Now, an object cannot move through space faster than the speed of light. But space itself can stretch at any rate. It can stretch faster than the speed of light. Mm -hmm. There can be objects actually farther enough away from us that are moving from us the speed, the speed They're not higher than Right, but they're not moving through space. Space itself is dragging them away from us faster than the speed of light. That's the conceptual difficulty with that. Yep. The difference between moving through space versus the space itself stretching. So how did they, how did they settle though at 13.7 billion? <laughs> I mean, see, that's the thing. Well, we can only see so far right now. I mean, our telescopes can only see, let's say, 13.7 billion years or whatever. However far we think we, those galaxies are. Well, the most distant but, thing... But we must realize, somebody must have come up and said, 
we just can't see the rest of it. It's, it's out there. It well, could be another 40 or 50. The most distant thing that we can see is something called the cosmic background radiation. And that's the most distant thing that we can ever possibly see. Because you're looking back in time to a time when the universe was hotter, much hotter than what it is today, and to a time when all of the hydrogen gas in the universe was ionized. And at that point, the universe is opaque to light. So from our location in the universe, we can look all the way back to a time when the universe is opaque to light. And the photons of light from that cosmic background radiation have been traveling to us. It took, it takes them 13, it took them 13.7 billion years to get to us. So we have a record of that, that expansion history from that time in the universe to today. So putting it all together, the expansion history, uh, what the temperature was at that time, and so forth, they're able to pull out that number uh, of 13.7. It's not a trivial calculation. Because <laughs> you do have, this stretching of the universe comes out of Einstein's general relativity, so you have to use all the, that mathematical machinery as well. Uh, they have to do that to get this expansion history as well. You sure you didn't get that out of some book? <laughs> um, yeah, my question. Einstein's book. <laughs> okay, if the universe is expanding, are the galaxy expanding? And if they are, what is the central thing holding that the stars move around? Okay, so the quote local expansion that's occurring from one side of the galaxy to the other, you can basically ignore. It's it's kind of trivial. Uh, and then the local gravity is going to trump that expansion anyways. This expansion is happening everywhere simultaneously. It's happening in this room, but it's unmeasurable. But when you're talking about millions of light years, billions of light years, all that stretching uh, adds up. Have we, have we been able to determine the difference or, or, or whether something is traveling through space versus space stretching it away from us? Well, what they have to do, when you observe, when they're observing these galaxies, let me go back to this one, there's probably multiple redshifts occurring at the same time there. Uh, that galaxy is moving through space in addition to space itself expanding. So uh, they, you would like to subtract out the part of the galaxy moving through space, which is causing a Doppler shift versus the stretching, which is causing something called a cosmological redshift. So ferreting those things out is, is something that they have to do. Okay. Now, one way they can do that is a lot of times these galaxies are in clusters. And so those galaxies are all orbiting around a common center of mass. And so if you observe enough of those galaxies, you can take out the motion of the individual galaxies and then figure out what the entire cluster is doing in terms of the expansion. So the expansion is actually really small, but there's a lot of it going on, in other words. What, what it's happening everywhere simultaneously. And when you're talking about, again, large distances, right. it's it adds up. Okay. Now, as far as space-time itself, I mean, are we, are we kind of guessing that the dark energy is part of, of the of space-time? Is it, is it not something outside affecting space-time? I mean, where, where exactly is it uh, actually interplay? Some of that we don't know yet. Uh, and, and like I said, Einstein predicted the dark energy, essentially. If you, it, it, back when he formulated general relativity, and when he started doing calculations about the universe, he was having a hard time coming up with a universe that didn't either expand or collapse. And this was before Hubble. And before Hubble, the astronomers were saying the universe is static. And he did these calculations, and he's like, I can't make a static universe 
without introducing a factor that he called the cosmological constant. And so this dark energy appears to be that constant where they've had to add it back into his original equations. Now again, physically what it is, that hasn't been answered. We can describe what it's doing and put it into the equations, but Well, there's, there's some guesses out there. Uh, there's something called quintessence, uh, which gets into quantum mechanics. Uh, quantum mechanics and Heisenberg's uncertainty principle allows particles to pop into existence and go out of existence. Now, that might be providing a, quote, pressure. But that hasn't, that hasn't been... So that might be providing a pressure term in the general relativity okay. equations. Yeah. I'm always interested in how successful scientists can find terms that fit for, I haven't got a clue. <laughs> because, I mean, basically Einstein had a formula that had six or seven variables that he understood that was close to an answer, and he had to plug something in to make it all work. And the cosmological constant was essentially there's something going on I ain't got a clue about. And we talk about dark matter and dark energy as things that we all understand. It's got a nice term, but I ain't got a clue. That's what science is all about. Right. In the, 19, in the 1920s, uh, in, the, in, the, in the late uh, 1920s, 1930s, they postulated that there was some unknown media that, w w that allowed light to propagate and gravity to propagate. They called it ether. You know, so it almost sounds like we're coming back to the idea of ether in some way. So yeah, it, that's 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 the nature of the forefront of science, and and basically, a, a good way to think about science is you try to figure out how the universe works, but you try to do so as much as possible in a way that you're not going to fool yourself. And and when you run. When you run up against observations like this, you start groping around trying to figure out what's happening. So you start putting ideas out there. And that, that's the nature of the forefront of science. That's where the fun is happening. We've got time for one last question here. Does dark matter love us? <laughs> that's a good one, good one to end on. <laughs> Depends on what you mean by love. But if you mean attraction, Yes. We are attracted to dark matter. Right. And in fact, if we weren't attracted to dark matter, we wouldn't know it was there. That's the only way we know it's there, is by its gravity. Scott is a regular member. He's going to be uh, at many of the, our events. He's going to be here afterwards. You're going to hang around. So yep. he's available for more questions later, but let's give him a round of applause.